highly chaotic, disordered state. And it is that which makes us think there's an arrow of time. It's that which makes us think there's a direction of time. And it's that which makes us think that moving into the future really is different to moving into the past. It's not a causal law in the sense that entry is made to go up. It just happens that if you start off with something that's very ordered and allow this, this kind of process to take place, extremely high probability ends up in a disordered state. But there's a problem there. Because I've used the word, you know, it's just there's a high probability involved in that. So that means that there's some small probability that that won't happen. So this was the insight that Poincaré and Zamello actually developed in the sort of the 19th century as a sort of a challenge to Boltzmann's view. So Boltzmann had thought that he'd derived or shown how you get a law of entropy increase, how entropy always increases to its maximum value. But Poincaré and Zamello said, well, hang about, this, this can't be the case. If you wait long enough, the low entropy states that you start off have to recur. If you start off with a little bottle full of gas, if you open the bottle and the gas comes out and spreads across the room, well, if you wait long enough, all of it is actually, you're going to eventually see it all go back into the bottle. And you might think, well, maybe that's actually something to do with some specific details of the dynamics. Maybe if you had a different dynamics, that wouldn't happen. But what Poincaré and Zamello proved was that actually under a very general condition, that is inevitably going to happen. If you wait long enough, all of the gas is going to gather back in the corner room. And that means you can't have a law that entropy always increases, because those low entropy states are going to come back. And Boltzmann solves this by means of this bold cosmological hypothesis. If you imagine you've just got an infinite amount of time, if, if time just doesn't have any limit in either direction, and you just sit around and wait, most of the time the universe is going to be in a high entropy state. But every now and then, you're going to get a fluctuation out of equilibrium. It's going to go away from equilibrium. It's going to get, move into a low entropy state. But once it's moved out into equilibrium, it's going to go down into some valley, and then it's going to head back to equilibrium again. And Boltzmann makes a remarkable suggestion at this point. If you look at the physical states as we're moving from the bottom of the valley to the top of the valley on our side of this curve, well, it's the same kind of physical states on the other side of the valley. But now those physical states are going to have memories still of the bottom of the valley. Everything is going to be working in the opposite direction. So they're going to see the direction of time in the opposite direction to the way we're seeing it. So once again, we come back to this idea, there is no flow of time, there is no fundamental direction of time in the physics. It's just that there's sequences of physical states, and what we perceive to be the direction of time, is just where we are sitting. If we're sitting on one side of the valley, then we'll see the sequence of states going in the other direction. But there's no actual direction to time itself. It's just where we're sitting in the valley. OK, well, that sounds a bit crazy, but it may, at least it makes sense, at least it explains things. But the problem with this point of view is that larger fluctuations, deeper valleys, are rarer than small fluctuations, shallow valleys. If you're flipping a coin and you're looking for sequences of heads, a long sequence of heads is a low entropy fluctuation. Two heads in a row will happen fairly frequently. Ten heads in a row gets very rare, and a thousand heads in a row you have to wait a long time for. The suggestion Boltzmann's making is that our universe and its early low entropy state is one enormous fluctuation out of equilibrium is the kind of fluctuation that's going to be very, very rare. There's the evidence we have now for a low entropy past, whether it's archaeological evidence, it's films, it's books, it's carvings. All of these are records about a low entropy past that exists today. Now, we can just suppose that they're true, but we could also say, well, hang on, what's the most likely explanation for all of these records to come about. 
All we need is to have a valley that's just low enough to fit in the world as we see it today. And that is a world, a valley, in which history doesn't actually go back very far before we have the bottom of the valley. That's a fluctuation that we've got equilibrium, and then in the middle, at the bottom of the valley, what we have is a set of records existing that do not actually represent what really happened. More likely than that 10,000 years of human history that there was a million years of geological record was that there was actually only 100 years. But actually, 100 years ago is still not the most likely, because 10 years ago would still account for all of our existing records. In fact, 10 years ago is actually still less likely than 10 minutes ago. That's less likely than 10 seconds ago. The most likely explanation for all of our experiences is all of this just came into existence a few seconds ago. But it's not just on time as well, it's also about space, because we point our telescopes out and we look out into the rest of the universe, uh, and we think we see lots of structure out there. But actually, again, the most likely explanation is not that there's actually an entire universe that came into existence. The most likely explanation is that there was actually a very small area of space that comes into existence, looking as if there is an entire universe. Given that we're sitting here with our memories in this room, what's the most likely explanation of it from this point of view is that this room just came into existence about 10 seconds ago, and that's it. In fact, even worse, we end up with a situation where more likely even that this room and all of us, all of the books and so forth, in this room came into existence is that actually maybe it's just me. Maybe just I came into existence. And that actually everything that I'm seeing isn't real. It's actually just a bunch of photons that have come into existence, hitting the sensory inputs to my head, making me think that there's a world and other people out there. And that's more likely on this picture than that there really is a world out there. The most likely explanation for all of my memories and experiences is that I'm actually a spontaneously formed brain sitting in a bunch of thermal fluctuations that just happened to have all of the nerves and sensory inputs to that brain being stimulated in a way that makes it look like that there is a world out there that I am experiencing. It's a smaller valley to actually create just those sensory simulations than it is to actually create a world that is responsible for those simulations. But that means we've got into a very bizarre situation. We've now got to ourselves that if Boltzmann's picture is correct, then we're almost led to a point where we've argued scientifically that we should believe that the external world doesn't exist, that we should believe that time doesn't exist, we should believe, in fact, that other people don't exist. We've led ourselves into a scientific argument for a position called solipsism, that there is just you and your experiences. But it's still worse, it's even worse though, because why were you led to believe this? You were led to believe it because that was the picture that science gave you, that was the picture that physics gave you, because we went out and we did experiments and we discovered the laws of physics and we took our current best laws of physics and we worked out according to our current best laws of physics what the most likely explanation was for our experiences. Well, why do we believe in those current best laws of physics? Because we did experiments or some other scientists did experiments in the past and left records for us. But now according to that picture we no longer believe in those records. So the scientists never actually performed them. So why did we believe in those laws of physics in the first place?